Hello, everyone. So we are here today in our next session of our developer series. Um, we've built this really to give engineers an insight as to how we've been thinking about the new protocol that we're launching at Aragon and how our engineering teams have been thinking of trade-offs and architectural decisions um, when looking at building such a new protocol. So with us today here, we have our rock star engineer, Jordi from Aragon, um, and he'll be taking us a bit through the protocol and, and how the development process worked. So Jordi, could you give, please give us a bit of like a TLDR on what the Aragon protocol is in the first place? Yeah, sure. So the Aragon protocol is a set of smart contracts that allow communities to race, emerge, and operate in any imaginable way that you can you know, think of today. Uh, there is, you know, DAO contracts and these DAOs install plugins. These plugins implement very simple functionalities, but you can compose them together, right? And governance plugins, they allow members to approve proposals so that the DAO can go and do something as a, as a global entity, as a community thing. And it tries to mimic what social groups are. So in general, social groups, they are fluid, they are flexible, they are living creatures. Uh, in the sense of new people coming in, new people can join groups, associations, companies, you know, and we map this through the use of a token, which is a very typical use case. And we also mimic this uh, in the form of structures. So a company can have a board, a company can have directors or can have maybe the assembly to decide to do something. Uh, we also mimic this behavior from social um, groups and organizations. Uh, the TLDR here that everything is a permission for us and these permissions can be easily granted and revoked and this is the simplest thing that we think that allows us to achieve this uh... very nice um, and i love how you just mentioned you know that in many ways we're building a tool for humans and how they're interacting with each other so maybe if you could dive in a bit deeper as like how the stack really works for building such a such a tool first of all you use one of our dao factories to create your own dao right you get your very own single unique DAO contract, and then you start building your community on top of it. Basically, the contract holds everything, and the DAO contract is the one being able to execute things with the exterior world. And then DAOs start installing plugins or granting permissions to external actors so that they can operate. Uh, other developers, for example, they can build plugins to solve very specific challenges which then DAOs can install and they can compose, as I say, right, to achieve more uh, complex or more specific custom flows that they need uh, to work with their own circumstances. We also have, um, besides the, the core, the blockchain itself, uh, we also have uh, subgraphs, a means of indexing everything that happens on chain for easy access. And then we also have the toolkit for developers, the SDK, which provides a very simple and easy to use way to wrap any calls for anything you would like to do with the protocol. You basically don't need to worry about the complexity that's behind and you don't need to worry about the environment. And at the same time, every different plugin has its own client, which is specialized and focused in the concrete implementation, the, the specific features that this plugin provides. Nice. So you've spoken to us a bit about a DAO contract, a factory contract, plugins. Um, what would you say are some of those like main contracts of the of the protocol? So first of all, there is the as I said, the DAO contract itself, which is the holding. Uh, it does two things. So one of them is holding and being able to execute things. Uh, the other thing is basically the permission management, which is embedded in the DAO. So you can think of it maybe as, as a parliament in which, uh, so the outcome of the parliament sets a law, right? And then this law is set in stone and uh, this is what the DAO enforces. Then we also have two registries. We have the DAO registry and the plugin registry. We use the registry so that basically we have a, a unique source of truth in terms of what exists. Maybe it is a census of DAOs. Uh, and we also have the plugin registry, which is where third party developers or even Argon itself publishes any new version of the different plugins that you can choose to have installed. We also have the DAO factory, which is what you use to create your own DAO. And we also have the plugin factory, which is what developers use to release any new versions. And then we also have another piece, which is called the plugin setup processor, which is the successor of a component that was known as APM, so the old Argon package manager. 
And what it does is basically it handles plugin installs. So APM, maybe it relates more to, to the plugin registry, but what its component does is it handles installations, updates, and uninstallations of plugins, pretty much as if you were installing an application. And for us, plugins, which is the next type of contract that we have, for example, they are designed to be encapsulating not just uh, smart contract code, but also to be encapsulating uh, user interfaces, to be encapsulating SDK clients for browsers so that uh, you can integrate them in the central applications, etc. So these are plugins. This is one of the fundamental pieces that we have. And these plugins at the same time, they also need their own plugin setups, right? So in the end, developers who want to develop a plugin, they develop the plugin itself, and they also develop the plugin setup, which takes care of the installer, the uninstaller, et cetera. Nice. Um, so I really like this idea of plugins because in many ways it works for like the extensibility of logic that we can add into organizations that are, of course, evolving, right? I think often when we speak about DAOs and really just on-chain organizations, um, these are contracts that are immutable and unable to change. Um, and you mentioned previously in, in a few questions previous um, that you really see permissions as this uh, law right, that is being enforced within um, within the contracts, thinking that like every permission can be granted or revoked um, to different addresses. So maybe to just dive in a bit deeper into that, um, why do you think permission management system is really the best way to architect a DAO framework? Well, I already mentioned some of the benefits before. Uh, in my opinion, it's one of the cleanest ways possible to install or uninstall plugins. So you still can use the grant and revoke permissions as a sort of low level, the, the manual way. But the beautiful part of this is that you can use the entire plugin ecosystem as a, an application manager, as a plugin manager for your DAO. And then when you install a plugin, uh, update it, and then after potentially uninstall it, you have a, an encapsulated way and you have a clean way for it to be part of your DAO and then eventually later on just be removed with no side effects. This is one of the beauties that you would not achieve otherwise. At the same time, it allows for this fluidity that I was mentioning before. So there are not two DAOs made equal. Two different DAOs are going to need different permissions, different plugins, different setups. And being able to grant and revoke these permissions allows you to evolve over time. Maybe you want to start with a DAO which uh, starts with maybe the admin plugin in which one person is able to do everything because you want to do the setup of things in a DAO world. But maybe later you want to evolve into a multi seed driven DAO and maybe later you want to evolve into minting a token which the community uses for voting. So even the same DAO is not the same over time. And this permission management system basically allows for this. So uh, a very easy way to, for you to pivot to iterate without having to recreate your own down. Super interesting. Thank you for that, for that rundown. That's really helpful. And so you mentioned, you know, some benefits, some, some hardships. Uh, what are some, I'd say, like technical difficulties that you guys faced when you were thinking of the architecture of the protocol? Yeah, well, you know, permission management systems, in the end, they reflect human nature. And sometimes um, it can happen that humans decide to approve something that maybe they shouldn't, right? You cannot do something about this. There's also a component of, um, well, we're super early in this space. This space is quite new. And... Potentially in some ways, we are the first ones to reach certain situations. And there are some roles that need to be defined, right? So what is actually the responsibility uh, of Argon? What is maybe the responsibility of developers, of the community itself? And we are finding challenges here in being the first ones to have certain debates and certain discussions, you know? Nice. And considering that, were there any other ideas that you guys consider when you were architecting the framework? So maybe from a technical perspective, but we want external developers to be explicit. So one thing is us as Argon, people already know the project and well, we do our audits, everything. But for any potential third party plugin existing there, there needs to be a very easy way to audit it and to make sure that it does what it should be doing. So we want uh, plugin developers to be very explicit. Also, we want all things, uh, which is, for example, members not having to pay for features that they don't use 
So in this space, it's quite easy to say, oh yeah, let's start adding X, Y, Z. Let's add a ton of features. But the problem is that then you make the protocol more sluggish and heavier, et cetera, et cetera, and more expensive. This is something we want to make sure that if you don't need something, you should not be carrying the weight of something that you don't use. And our principle, I would say, keep it simple, stupid, part of what I mentioned before. One of the things that a lot of times uh, happens when you need to create something new is that making things seem easy is probably the most difficult task you can make, right? So the goal is to make it seem easy, approachable to everyone, despite the huge effort behind to actually make it seem so. Yeah, 100%. Um, That's very true. So it's very interesting, especially looking at it from a perspective of uh, the optionality that you guys had and then kind of the decision that you ended up making, considering that optionality. What were some like technical difficulties that you faced when you were architecting the protocol? Well, the main one is that uh, when you're designing something like a kernel, there are just too many interrelated pieces in, in a complex protocol like this. Despite the many efforts you can try to do to simplify it, at some point, you may need to touch one thing in one place and see that this affects many, many other ones. This is a huge challenge, but we, we took it and, and here we are. And uh, at the same time, it's hard to keep isolated architectural discussions. Sometimes you need to decide what's the best way to solve a problem, but you need to keep 30 million pieces in your mind at the same time for the same reason. Uh, at the same time, there's sometimes there is no right solution to a problem and you have to find a good compromise between ease of audit clarity safety economic execution of transactions etc and sometimes unfortunately you have to choose for one of them sometimes there is no middle ground and as i already mentioned before a bit you know one of the challenges is as well okay defining who is responsible for what so for example we as argon we are responsible of anything wrong that the protocol might do, right? And uh, obviously as well from any plugins that we develop ourselves. But for example, plugin developers, they have their own set of responsibilities. This has to be defined. They could be malicious. They could try to trick DAOs into thinking that their plugin does something that actually doesn't do and misusing the permissions that this plugin may have been given. But at the same time, it could be the case that maybe developers didn't understand something because the protocol was not well-defined. So here there's a clever line between these boundaries, but there are also more uh, boundaries. So there's also the responsibility of proposal creators. So we could imagine that Aragon made uh, things properly and developers made things properly, but let's imagine that a malicious actor creates a proposal and tries to trick the community into thinking that this is a good idea to approve this proposal and install some plugin that has some permissions. In this case, same thing, there's this responsibility. And there's still the last boundary that we can think of, which is ultimately the community members. So if there's something as a proposal that is not really legitimate or that it's not a good idea or installing something that's not necessary or agreeing to grant more permissions that a plugin or some person needs to do something, ultimately this is their responsibility. And these are the four boundaries that we we have had to spend a lot of time to clearly identify, to to reflect about. And ultimately, this has been affecting how the protocol looks as of today. Of course. Yeah, the, those are so many components to put together. Um, and especially when you're building a structure for such human behavior, I bet there's a lot of edge cases that can come around and just increase the complexity of building something that, like you said before, should feel so easy and so smooth to use. I guess on on that same flow, how is the software development process done? Uh, How are the teams divided? Well, uh, at Aragon Globally, we have what we call the core team and then the app team. Basically, the core team, we work in the protocol and everything that supports it. So we have the smart contracts and also we have the subgraph and the SDK, which is the, the companion tooling to enable any developer to make use of it. And then on the other side, we have the app team, which basically they build the wonderful front end that allows you uh, as a human to make use of it. So we have different proposal, uh, value propositions. So one for developers and the other one for humans, for community members, for DAO members. Nice. 
And having worked in other teams in the past, uh, what would you say are some differences between, say, like Web2 engineering teams versus uh, Web3? Yeah, well, for sure, there are many. The most obvious one of them is that in Web3, there is no control Z to undo something. Whenever something has already happened in a blockchain, it's there and you can just not undo it. You cannot do an upgrade process or you cannot run a batch update job in a database because this is not viable here. Or if you have been hacked, basically, there is no way to undo it. This is a huge first difference. And um, here, for example, uh, imagine that we want to add a new feature. We want to roll a new feature for, for DAOs. Well, the challenge here is that every single DAO being created today would have to voluntarily and proactively decide to upgrade itself, right? Whereas let's imagine that there is some plugin in a specific version. And for some reason, well, uh, you want to update this version of the plugin. Well, each different DAO will have to do this proposal uh, on its own because this is also a consequence of this sovereignty that you have. Yeah, at the same time at the protocol level, well, all, all of the pieces have to snap all at once. Whereas in the Web2 web world, you can be a bit more iterative, right? You can start small and then keep growing. So we try to do this as much as possible at Argon still, but on the protocol level, you must have the minimum value proposition all there on day one, right? And you don't have the luxury of being able to do migrations or being able to do mass uh, upgrades on things that people are using. Super interesting. Thank you for that rundown. I think especially for developers who may be jumping on board in the Web3 world, um, or even those who have already been coding for blockchain development, um, certainly all of what you've mentioned are realities that software engineering teams are still in many ways trying to figure out and, and solve themselves. So it's great to hear kind of your intake from, from your experience in doing so for the last few years. Um, now, I want to kind of wrap things up. You've spoken a lot today to us about these plugins and how they extend functionality for DAOs. Maybe if you could give us a bit of a, a rundown or, or a little bit of a sneak peek on what are some plugins that you guys have been creating, any cool ones that you're looking up to build in the next few months, anything that you can share in that regard. I'm sure everyone here would be excited to hear. Yeah, sure. So on day one, the idea is to launch uh, with a set of four different plugins, which give you a gradient, a gradient of um, agility versus decentralization. So the first four would be first the admin plugin in which let's imagine that uh, a DAO is created by one person who wants to experiment and then progressively grow. So the admin plugin, the person defined as the admin can do everything. Then uh, we have the multi sig plugin in which, uh, well, a set of wallets can approve something. Then we have something which is very similar to the multi plugin, but not exactly the same, which we call the address list plugin. And uh, conceptually, it's very similar to multi plugin, but the concept is, is that instead of approving, what you want to do is voting. So you have a list of wallets or addresses, can be contract as well, which can either vote yes, no, or can abstain if they want. And then there is a limited amount of time in which they can vote, right? Uh, there could be automatic execution if certain conditions are met, etc. Then we have the plain old well-known token voting. So if you have uh, an ERC20 token, potentially an NFT as well, you can cast depending on your uh, a vote, you can, depending on your voting power. These are the four we ship on day one. Coming up, we have other ideas. The most interesting one that we're working on is uh, called OVOT, which is off-chain voting with on-chain execution. And this allows for, uh, you know, the name says it all, we call it OVOT. Uh, this means that you can vote uh, in a backend service. This backend service uh, costs no money for people to go and cast a vote. And then there is a roll-up transaction that computes the results and submits these results in chain. So this eliminates the friction for people to be, go there and vote. And this also provides a degree of anonymity when, the, well, basically the results are submitted on chain. You don't know exactly who got that what, but you know that these results are correct and they are true to what people actually did. There's all the plugins, these are just ideas, but you could decide, for example, that your DAO has a streaming plugin. You could decide that um, the multi-sig plugin, for example, we have a backend version of the multi-sig so that uh, signers don't need to send transactions on chain. 
or you could maybe have more um, plugins that provide additional user experience. And um, for example, for swapping tokens on Uniswap or any other portal like this, uh, or for example, UIs for um, built-in recipes for DeFi or charts about your um, asset holdings or aggregators for news or anything that you could think of. It doesn't have to be limited to the smart contracts themselves. You could have a plugin without the smart contract, but expanding the UI that you could potentially add to your DAO. Super nice. I'm excited to see all this all this work. I think we're kind of reaching a point um, in the DAO ecosystem where we're really defined kind of how organizations are being structured and looking at new integrations with even existing projects um, certainly allows for that composability that uh, has been brewing the ecosystem for so long. So all of that is very exciting to hear. Um, and I guess just one last question to, to finish this uh, great talk. And thank you so much for your insights, Jordi. But looking to hear, you know, beyond kind of the what we think of as DAOs and, and, you know, the traditional uses that we see for a DAO framework, what are some other maybe like DAP ideas that you think could be built on top of the Aragon protocol? Well, that's interesting for sure, because here the, the imagination is the limit. But for example, we internally tend to think of just digital organizations, right? Not everything is black or white. Not everything is DAO only, not everything is Web3 only. Uh, we think that there's a very interesting gradient between these two worlds. And we think that the next 10,000 DAOs are going to come from the two Web 2.0, let's say, world, and are going to be interested to progressively pivot towards a more Web 3.0 experience. And that's the main reason why we have a protocol that allows this to be as much fluid as possible, as much progressive, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In the end, anything that a community can do together can find a plugin to help. These plugins can be just a backend, can be a smart contract, can be just a UI. Developers decide what the recipe is for trying to solve a certain problem, for trying to serve a certain audience with different needs and different circumstances. And uh, I would say, yes, I'm just eager to see what the community is going to think and what the developer community as well is going to come up to in terms of ideas and value propositions and yeah, experiences for those. Amazing. Well, that is great to hear, Jordi. Looking forward to that future. <laughs> Thank you so much for everyone listening in. Thank you, Jordi, for your time. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again in the next developer series that we'll be hosting. Bye, everyone. My pleasure.